Hello, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be in the world. Um, and welcome to Wild China On Air and our book club series. Um, if you've been following the series, you will notice that I am not your normal host, um, Wild China's founder, Mei Zhang. And unfortunately, she was not able to be with us today. Um, so my name is Emma. I am Wild China's head of leisure travel. And it is an absolute pleasure to be here and to host today's Q&A. Um, so if you've been following the series, you'll also have heard May talk just a little bit about why we are hosting these events. Um, Wild China is a travel company, um, but we, we never really think of ourselves as that. Um, we work to connect people through travel. We want to share stories and foster a better understanding um, of China and everything that we love about it. So if you visit China with us, we will show you food, architecture, literature, history, cultures, languages. Um, and we figured, you know, we can't welcome you to China right now, but we can still share all of those things from you, from our home to yours. Um, and that is the reason that we have been hosting our Wild China On Air series. So last week, we spoke with Neil Schmid, um, a leading scholar in Buddhism's visual culture, live from the Morgau Caves. Um, in last month's book club, we spoke to Amy Chua um, about her memoir, Battle Hymn of a Tiger Mom. Um, and you can read, you can see all of those. Um, they are hosted on our YouTube channel. So if you search Wild China, if you want to go back and see previous events, um, you can do so there. So today, I am absolutely thrilled um, to be joined by best-selling author, Paul French. Um, so Paul has written for numerous publications throughout his career, um, including the Washington Post, The Guardian, The Diplomat. Um, Wikipedia told me you write for the UK's Real Crime magazine, which is also very cool. I like um, that. <laughs> and and um, Paul has specialized in writing books um, about modern Chinese history and contemporary Chinese architect um, society, sorry, um, and spent many years living and working in China yourself. Um, so you may have read Paul French's Midnight in Peking, um, which was listed on numerous bestseller lists all around the world and won several awards. Um, and this month, we have really, really enjoyed um, reading or listening to, I should say, um, Paul's newest book, which is available exclusively on Audible, um, Murders of Old China. So Paul, welcome to our China's Book Club. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a pleasure, obviously, to come and talk about murder. <laughs> I'm very excited. Um, so as a company, as well, China, we, we specialize in helping people to see different sides of China, different histories, um, different things that often go unheard or unseen, or it's hard to access um, by yourself in China. And so your book really piqued our interest because it talks about a period of contemporary Chinese history that actually a lot of people know nothing about. Um, and even myself, right, as a China specialist, still feel like I learn something new every day. Um, so I have lots of questions from me, from my Mei Zhang, from our audience. Um, if you are listening today, you can absolutely post your questions in the comment box, and I will get through as many of them as possible in the next hour. Um, but Paul, just to start, so for any audience members who are with us today who perhaps haven't read or finished Murders of Old China yet, do you mind just giving us an introduction to the book and sort of setting the scene for the period of history that we're really talking about here? Well, uh, well, thank you, Emma. Um, as, as a lot of people know, I've kind of created this niche for myself, which I kind of, I own, I own the space of talking about bad foreigners in China um, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, I, I don't do the, the, the bad foreigners now. Um, I'll leave that for, for someone else. You can't be greedy. But um, uh, they're, they're, of course, you know, it, it's fascinating at the moment uh, looking at um, everything that's going on with statues and um, history 
at the moment um, in the UK and America and elsewhere, because of course, even if you know we're very unaware of our of, of history of, of foreign history in China, true mm -hmm. of the UK, even more true of the US, I think. Um, so it, very rarely is it taught in schools. It is sometimes taught in schools, but very rarely. And most people really have no idea of, of how we got to the position of relationship with China that we have, um, that we don't know about. And particularly in the UK, I know that lots of people, and in America, lots of people have a link with China, a family link that they maybe don't even know about um, in a way that uh, many people do still understand the links with India and maybe other parts of the world. Um, and also people had written books about foreigners in India. I mean, there's a whole library shelf of books, good, bad and ugly about, um, about uh, uh, the, uh, foreign, the, the Raj, right? From E.M. Forster all, all the way through. Um, there's less of that on China. And then of course in China, we had this great interruption. So, you know, we go up to about, China of course is the first country really to, to be in the second world war. I mean, China was invaded by Japan in 1937. So, from 1937, when most of the foreign community in the country evacuated uh, or, or were put into, uh, or, or slightly later were put into internment, there really uh, ha hasn't been anyone, you know, the bamboo curtain came down in 1949 after the war. And, and so we lost this connection with China. So we have these kind of situations now. I mean, I know when the coronavirus first came along and we had Wuhan in lockdown, you know, I was talking to lots of people about you know, I was getting lots of queries from people about what is Wuhan, you know, where is Wuhan, um, you know, how do you pronounce Wuhan, um, and, things. and I thought well, this is really weird because Wuhan would have been a town that certainly if you were English and probably if you were American or French or most European countries, your grandparents and your great grand, certainly my grandparents and your great grandparents would have known. It was a big trading town for us. It was a treaty port like Shanghai, like Tianjin, um, not a colony like Hong Kong or Singapore, but, but a treaty port. And so, so we had this relationship with these cities. And so the number of people whose families, including mine, uh, either served with the, Royal, with the Navy or the Army or the diplomatic corps or were business people with all one of the big companies, I don't know, take your pick, Jardines, Swires, um, you know, uh, all those enormous companies that did business in Asia. Um, is, is very large, but, but we've lost that link. So some people, of course, are, are slightly surprised when they go back and find out that, you know, why was the murder of an English girl in 1937 such a big deal um, in Beijing? Or why were all of these refugee Jews and uh, exiled white Russians, the, the Russian emigres from the Bolshevik Revolution, in Shanghai, you know, 25,000 refugee Jews from fascism in the late 1930s, 30,000 uh, Russian emigres in Shanghai alone, more and others in Harbin, Tianjin, uh, Beijing. There was this massive foreign presence in all of those cities, both um, as a sort of semi-colonial presence. Uh, you know, of course, Shanghai and the treaty ports were created after the Opium Wars, but um, also this kind of, um, exile presence of refugees. So, and of course, as I write about, a certain amount of the criminal underworld who just went to what they saw as the end of the earth uh, beyond um, the arm of the law in America or Britain or France or wherever, and set themselves up in business uh, there. And all of this is part of China's history. And all of this is part of our collective human history. And because of um, the way things panned out after 1949, uh, we have kind of had this period where for 30, 40 years, nobody went to China, no one had any connection. So we had a generational break, a generational um, gap in our collective memory, both, both Chinese people and foreign people. So when I first went to China as a student in the 1980s, I did meet Chinese people who spoke perfect English, far better English than I speak as a sort of, you know, working class North London oik. I mean, they, they were kind of speaking missionary school um, English, and it was absolutely excellent. They were people who had worked for Jardine Matheson. They were people who had, you know, had jobs with uh, foreign companies. And they were still around, old people. Uh, the jazz musicians at the, um, the old Cathay Hotel, which by then had become the Peace Hotel, those people were still around. Most of those have gone now, and they haven't kind of passed that tradition on to their, or that history on to their um, children and grandchildren by and large. 
So, so all of us have kind of largely forgotten. I didn't know. I mean, I had spent two years in Shanghai as a student in the 1980s, gone back in the 1990s, and it was not until the early 2000s that I discovered that my own great grandfather spent two years in Shanghai with the Royal Navy running the coaling station for the Royal Navy's Far Eastern fleet um, out of Pudong. Um, you know, and uh, there I was sitting in Shanghai rather grandly telling everyone I'd never live in Pudong. I'd never have anything to do with Pudong. It's a terrible place. I'd only live in Pushi. It turns out my grandfather lived in Pudong for two years. So um, that was kind of um, slightly odd. And uh, I, I, I sort of, a uh, great grandfather actually, I should say. Um, but so, so we did have this relationship with China. And I think part of what I do um, uh, through Midnight in Peking, which is about Beijing, through City of Devils, which is about Shanghai, and through Murders of Old China, which is about many different places across China, is try and revive and remember uh, that, that, that connected heritage, which is not always a positive one, um, and it's not always an easy one. It, it, it's very difficult, but it, but it is one that did exist. These people are all real. All of these murder cases actually happened. Um, and, and, you know, people were killed people actually killed, you know, it's, um, and, and, and it's all just part of the history um, that, that we can recover and, and, and find now. And with so many more people interested in China now, I guess there's been a market for what I'm doing. People have turned, pitched up in China from those early generations, even people before me and others who came in the sort of late seventies and the eighties, you know, who are all now getting on a bit, but you know, like, and then the, that younger generation that came in the sort of 90s and early 2000s when China really became sort of very interesting as, uh, uh, and felt quite wild and open and free and, and people that are still learning Chinese and studying and coming from the West. Um, you know, they are also finding this, this history of, you know what, you thought you were really cool for coming here for the first time, but 100 years ago, 150 years ago, there were, there were people doing exactly the same adventures and exactly the same uh, explorations across, across China. Um, so, so that's kind of where all my work is situated. Thank you. Um, and I, so in a bit later, I'd love to dig a bit deeper into some of those, those underworlds that you talk about. Um, but you, you said yourself, you sort of, you found your niche in, in foreigners doing bad things or, you know, bad things happening um, in China. What was it that drew you to that, to, to talk about murder, to talk about crime um, and use that perspective to reflect on history? Well, I think uh, there's a number of reasons. One is at the time that I started writing, which was sort of the early 2000s, true crime and sort of literary nonfiction of the sort of work that sort of Eric Larson does and people like that was becoming a really big genre. Lots of people were writing it. You know, when I was growing up, true crime equaled waste of time. The, the books were all rubbish, you know, they were all just sort of rubbish books about the mafia in America or the Cray twins in Britain. I mean, they were just, they were just useless. Now, of course, um, writers like Eric Larson, John Beren, um, people like that have, have created uh, true crime as a great genre. And the thing I think about crime is when a murder happens, um, no one, no one can't answer questions. So the police or the courts or the newspapers or whoever go in and they ask questions and you can't say no, all the skeletons are out of the cupboard. Everyone who has done something bad or had an affair or, or whatever it is they've done, you can't just walk away and not answer the questions anymore because murder is the most serious offense that there is. Um, and so murder is a very interesting way of looking at things because as I say, everything has to be thrown on the table. And a lot of it, but it's very difficult to research because of course, people that are criminals, whether they're professional organized criminals or whether they just happen to have stumbled into these things, they are um, not really going to tell you the truth and they're not going to want their pasts discovered. And if you read about China and, and I read several a week, there are endless memoirs. I mean, you could start now and read 10 a week. And when you were 90 years old, you wouldn't be even a quarter of the way into it of books by missionaries, which are really usually the most dreary, um, diplomats, uh, self-important and pompous business people, uh, well-meaning charitable uh, middle-class ladies. I mean, you know, there are endless amounts of these books. Um, and they don't really tell us very much. They may have some useful stuff for me, like what building 
a certain place occupied, what was at a certain address, which I use. They don't really tell us much. And also we then tend to fall into the, the problem of thinking that all the foreigners that are in China were either missionaries, diplomats or businessmen. Um, and they weren't. I mean, you know, people also came to China as people who wanted to run casinos or bars or to commit crime or to work as prostitutes or as pimps or, 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 as, or as any number of um, criminal activities as well. And there's various specific reasons for why they came to places like Shanghai particularly. Um, but it, it's something that, 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 that sort of interests me in order to get the balance. It's like I do, I do try to do quite a lot of work on historic preservation of architecture as well, particularly in Shanghai and with the hutongs in Beijing. And one of the things I'm always trying to, I mean, I get nowhere with it, but one of the things I'm always trying to do impress on local officials in Shanghai and Beijing is, you know, you can keep all the banks and the churches and, and that's great, but then we'll just be left thinking that all that was ever here was banks and churches, right? You know. We, we won't know where ordinary people lived. We won't know where ordinary people worked, you know. So we need the hutongs and we need the shikuman and the lilong in um, in Shanghai. You know, it, it, it has to be holistic that way. And, and our look at um, China has to be, uh, foreigners in China has to be holistic as well. And the last reason, of course, is if you walked into a bookshop thinking, you know, this weekend, the weather's not gonna be that great. You know, I've got the house to myself. I want to sit down and read a book. Do you want to read a book about a missionary? Or would you like to read a book about a guy who lived a really wild life and maybe committed a murder and maybe didn't? So it also, it also is a great genre for getting more people to read about China and more people to read about Chinese history. You know, all the books that come out on China are largely read by a very small coterie of people who have all read all of the books and comment on them and review them and all the rest of it. What I've tried to do very consciously is reach a much, much wider audience, an audience that maybe doesn't even know they want to read about China and doesn't really you know, want, want a history lesson on China, but they're gonna get one, but hopefully they'll be entertained along the way as well. And, and I think that's why, you know, because I have quite a big audience in the crime reading world and the true crime reading world and the historical fiction world, as well as the China crowd, um, gi gives me a kind of a, a much wider readership than a lot of other writers on China. Yeah, thank you. Um... And you're right, I absolutely loved listening to Murders of Old China. And actually a lot of people I know who I've recommended it to potentially aren't, you know, they aren't so interested in China itself, um, but actually it gives a really great perspective um, and a different way of learning about it. So yeah. yeah. Really I mean, well, one of the things that I've always aimed for, which I, which I didn't aim for, but has, has become quite fun is, um, you know, obviously, um, most foreigners, most expats who've lived in Beijing have probably read Midnight in Peking. It's just like a book everybody's read if they've lived in Beijing. Um, and the same is sort of becoming true about City of Devils if you live in Shanghai. And what I find is that I meet people who sort of, you know, if they've got parents visiting or relatives coming over, and they're just like, what, what do I give them, right? I mean, you know, my mum and dad aren't necessarily remotely interested in China. I can't give them like an economics textbook or, a, you know, what if the economic bubble bursts or you know is the government really authoritarian or isn't it they, they couldn't care less right you know but a murder mystery and then you know as a day out we can kind of walk around those hutongs and they can get a feel for it kind of really works so i've kind of become the the perfect gift for visiting relatives as well <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> um yeah i agree um so so this period of history that we're talking about it's sort of turn of the century up until 1940s right so that sort of period in history there um and what i find fascinating and i still am learning so much about is obviously we have more and more we have foreigners right in china at that time mm. as you said so after the opium wars we had the treaty ports set up um and we have all the different international settlements essentially especially in shanghai um mm. so each country essentially has its own little space um, that they live and they work and we're talking about sort of depression era in the US so you've got people traveling to China to sort of make their wealth and you know there's you're, you're right people coming um, from sort of Russia escaping the revolution you know there's so many people coming in um, and I think for me so all of these sort of settlements were set up um, and what I really loved about 
murders of old China is how you talk about the different court systems um, and how um, and how that worked. Do you mind just talking a bit more about that now and sort of how that worked in that period in Shanghai in particular? Yeah, well, it was true of Shanghai and it was true of um, Tianjin and it was true of all the other treaty ports, the much smaller ones like Xiamen, Fuzhou. I mean, you know, th there were many, many across the country. But Shanghai is the one we all think about, um, even though even though Tianjin was a very important city at that time. And, and several of the cases that I've looked at were in Tianjin. But basically what went along with the treaty ports, which, of course, the treaty ports were arrested from China by um, gunboat diplomacy during the Opium War. So China, you know, what was what is now quite rightly by the Chinese called the unequal treaties. Um, but what was also built into places like Shanghai was the concept of extraterritoriality, which is a bizarre concept. So the concept is that when you are in Shanghai, not necessarily when you're in all of China, but when you are within the treaty ports, you are not subject to Chinese law. You are only subject to the law of your own country. OK, that makes a certain amount of sense, except you've got something like 20 treaty port powers and then other countries as well. Plus, some of those treaty port powers are big colonial powers like Britain and France. So there's lots of other people that fall under their law, law, legal jurisdiction. So if you're British and you murder a British person and the witness to it is British, you can all go to the British court. And the British will basically... Uh, listen to the witness, listen to you, listen to the prosecution, and then make a decision. That, that's fairly straightforward. But if you're a British person and you murder an American, and the witness is, one witness is French and one witness is German, you, you've got an absolute nightmare of a legal situation to get through because technically the British court can't call, call the German, and if it's an American that got murdered, then they can't necessarily summon people to that court. So it's it doesn't really work um, because it was really designed to sort out business disputes. And it was also largely designed to sort out what happened if you died when you were in China and your estate needed to be sorted out. They didn't really think about it in terms of multinational, multicultural crime. And on top of that, there was what was called the mixed court where a Western judge uh, and a Chinese magistrate um, sat together to, to adjudicate cases between uh, disputes between Chinese and foreigners. And again, that was largely thought of as, well, what happens if a foreigner is renting a building from a Chinese and doesn't pay the rent or, you know, buy something from a Chinese company and then is a bad debt? They never thought about it in terms of what happens if murder and mayhem comes along. How do we sort that out? So in that, and of course, all of this was complicated by you know, uh, to use the language of these very moments, white privilege, racism, and all the rest of it with the idea. And, and in Murders of Old China, the, the first cases I talk about are really the first two or three white people, who, Europeans, or American, who were charged with the murder of a Chinese and, and how to deal with that, how to even bring them to court for something that was by many, many people at that time not even considered a crime, right? So, um, this was this was all highly problematic. And I have to say as well, the, the courts in China, you know, pick and choose which bits of the law of their own countries they like. So, for instance, the, the funniest one, I suppose, is when America decided to have prohibition, you know, an insane kind of law. Um, the, uh, all Americans in Shanghai should have been subject to the law of prohibition. They should not have been able to walk into the bar at the cafe hotel and have a drink. But of course, it was madness to expect that to happen in a city like Shanghai, where no other country had a, a prohibition and China itself had no prohibitions on alcohol. So no judge, no American judge in, in China ever tried to enforce prohibition. You know, and there's a very funny story where the Chinese, trying to be courteous, invited everyone to a reception in Shanghai and served drinks to everyone except the Americans. And the Americans, of course, all walked over to the bar and were like, oh, you know, whiskey, champagne, whatever. And the poor guys working, Chinese guys working at the bar were instructed not to serve Americans. Yeah. And in the end, the whole thing broke down because, you know, but the Chinese were just trying to be courteous. They didn't want to, 
you know, force Americans to break the laws of their own country. The Americans have sort of gone there desperate to break the laws of their own country, and no one was really worried about it. So it was a bizarre situation. And of course, it throws up within all of these cases that I, the 12 cases that I have worked on here, it throws up issues of territorial jurisdiction and just whether or not it's even possible to have a fair trial um, on, under a system as bizarre as this. Mm. Yeah, and then how did you zero, how did you sort of zero in on these 12 um, to feature? And um, what was it about them? Uh, that sort of, yeah, got your attention. Well, I'd always been looking for good murders. Um, and the Pamela Werner murder in Beijing happens to be the one that I, that, that, that became a book. So, so lots of cases are very interesting. They might make magazine articles, they might make chapters in a book, but there's not quite enough information there. There's not quite enough twists. To, to make a, a book like Midnight in Peking or, or City of Devils. Um, the other thing about true crime, of course, which is really important is someone has to have got caught or at least they have to have been charged with it. Otherwise you just haven't got enough paperwork. But if someone's charged with a crime, then you have court records, newspaper records, police records, you know, all the rest of it. And, and that gives you um, some archives you can work with. Ever since I wrote Midnight in Peking, which sort of, you know, did very well around the world, everyone's been telling me about every murder they've ever heard of in China, right? You know, so of course, you know, and, I, and I'd really like, like to pursue those. Um, and there were some that I've just never been able to find enough out about. There's one, there's one woman in America who keeps, I hope she's not on this, uh, on, on this pod, on this um, call, but she, um, she always sending me uh, newspaper articles about an uncle of hers who was in Guangzhou. And I was looking for a good juicy Guangzhou murder. Um, in the 1940s and was found in a hotel room with three other white men, all naked and all poisoned, dead. And they never worked out what the hell was happening. And she just said, and she always sends me these things that say, yes, well, you know, clearly they were poisoned, but why did they strip them naked? And I, you know, she's quite a nice lady and everything. And I haven't really got the I haven't quite got the guts to send her back and says, well, who says anyone stripped them naked, right? You know, who knows what was going on in that room when, uh, when, when someone decided to poison them. So there's clearly lots of different things going on around China at the time. The ones I've chosen are either ones that I can pick away at enough to get, to get, uh, to, to really build a story. They're also ones that are usually tell something about some aspect of Chinese history, whether it be, you know, warlordism that was going on at the time or the encroaching Japanese threat uh, or something like that. And in most cases, I did manage to find something new in those cases, something that wasn't known at the time, which, you know, is a whole question about how we do research now and what we're able to get that, that police and prosecutors weren't able to get at the time. But also in out of 12 cases, probably four or five, with information that I then discovered would now be con would now be mistrials, right? They would be thrown out for for mistrial, and um, that makes you wonder. If my hit rate was five out of twelve, and in that sense it was a random twelve because I didn't know I was going to find anything new on those twelve, um, that makes you wonder just how bad the state of justice was when it involved foreigners in China at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I really want to learn more about the Green Gang later, because that's one of my favorites. Um, but while we're talking about research um, and sort of what you've what you've managed to find out um, and you call in in the book about sleuthing with hindsight. Um, how does how does that work? How have you gone about that and where have you found the, the resources and the archives that sort of shed more light on this on these histories? But th th there are an amazing number of archives available to us now. And even during lockdown, you know, I'm able to carry on working because just the amount that's online, even, even if I can't get to libraries, libraries and archives personally. Um, it's, it's sort of amazing how much you can dig out. And it's also amazing how long things took to find. I'll give you an example. Um, for instance, in Midnight in Peking, and this happened to me two or three times in Murders of Old China as well. This situation arises. Someone tells the police that they studied at Harvard University. And that goes, it's not necessarily means that they murdered someone or not. But if they're lying about that, it goes to character. 
So the police are interested to find out if that person's telling them the truth. But it's 1937, it's China. What do you do? Well, the police in China write a letter in Chinese, which they then translate into English, and they post it to Harvard University in Boston. And it takes a minimum, we don't know how long it actually took, but it takes a minimum of six weeks to get there. And when it gets there, someone in Harvard has to read it and someone has to go through a card index and they have to bother to do all of that. And then they have to, you know, because some guy from Beijing police department wrote to them. And then they have to write a letter back and it's going to take a minimum of six to eight weeks to get back. So we're looking at maybe 14 weeks round trip for this. Well, in that case, during that time, the Japanese invaded Peking, Beijing, and um, if the, if the letter ever came back, there was no one there to receive it because the, the police were the nationalists and they had to disappear very quickly. What I could do, of course, was wake up in uh, London, or um, well, at the time I did it, wake up in Shanghai, email the archivist at Harvard University, um, go about my day, and then at the end of the day when America came online, I got an email pinged back from the archivist who says, yes, I've just put it into our database, there's no one by that name who was ever at Harvard University in the years that you said. So, you know, that was what, two, 2011 or something, right? So in 2011, I'm able to find out in 16, 17 hours what the police were never able to find out. Now, it doesn't solve the crime, but it, it, it catches someone out in a lie. And that person knew they could get away with a lie because, uh, they, uh, because you could not search that way. To give you an example from Murders of Old China, there was a judge, an American judge, who was in charge of trying an American man for attempted murder of his wife. They were both American, but America's a big country. Um, th there was no reason to believe that they would know each other. It was what's known as a bench trial, which the Americans used in China, which is where you don't have a jury. The judge hears everything and then makes the decision. But that man could have been executed. That man could go to prison for life. In the end, he was let off. Well, everyone at the time was rather surprised that he was let off, but they thought, well, maybe the judge knows more than, than we do. He's a judge after all. What I was able to do was put both the judge and the uh, person he was uh, trying, the, the suspected uh, murderer, into a, the newspaper database and see what came up. And of course, at the time of the trial, up came lots and lots of stories. But six years before, up came one tiny story in the newspaper of a small American town. And it was about a, an Elks dinner, you know, these charitable associations in America called the Elks. They had had a dinner in this small town to talk about, and they had a lecture on China. And the lecture on China was given by the man who was then the judge in China for this case. And it listed the 15 men in the audience that night. And one of them, was the man who was on trial in front of that judge. The two of them knew each other. But in 19, I forget, 1935, 1936, in Tianjin, where this took place, how would you be able to find a copy of the Albuquerque Daily News from six years before and find one tiny little article in there? You couldn't do it. Of course, now I can do that. Now that clearly would have been declared a mistrial. The fact that neither the judge nor the accused thought to tell anyone's lawyers or anyone at all that they actually had met before it, 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 and were both members of an Elks, the same Elks Lodge. That, that clearly is not acceptable. Um, yet it happened. And these things must have happened again and again. Out of those 12 murders, there are two instances where the judge and the accused knew each other and neither of them decided to tell anyone about it. And I think that that, uh, that goes to the heart of how bad justice was, but it also goes to the heart of you know, if we think people can get away with a lot now, I mean, you know, they used to be able to get away with anything. If you read City of Devils, everyone changes their name, everyone changes their age. And if you look at murders of old China, it's a similar thing. People are, once they are in China, what they did back in the West, wherever they came from, stays there, right? You know, you, it's virtually impossible to discover. Yeah, I would listen to that bit of the book. And I thought, <laughs> no way! When you realised that they knew each other, and you'd realise you'd managed to find that out, you know, a hundred so you know years later, that's just yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's just it's stunning to think uh, to think of the well, I don't know what you'd call it now, the gall of them to think that they could get away with it. You know, I mean, it's just 
And then these guys, I mean, of course, because the Japanese invaded Tianjin, they ended up back in America. And at no point did anyone ever find these things out, you know, and um, partly it was because there just wasn't the facilities to do it. But partly, you know, the main reason is people were dishonest. Judges were dishonest. Policemen were dishonest. And various citizens of different countries were also dishonest. So if, if you accept that, I forget which film it is or who famously said everybody lies. But, you know, if you accept that premise um, at that time in China, it was virtually impossible to prove that. Because th these weren't stories that were making the newspapers back home particularly. So, you know, because the newspapers didn't work that way. So there wasn't even anyone in Albuquerque who could jump up and sort of say, oh, yeah, I know that he knew that. You know, I mean, you could get away literally with murder. And, and as these cases show, people did. Yeah. And while we're on that and we're talking about sort of policemen being dishonest and people being dishonest, um, can you tell us a bit more about the Green Gang? That's my favourite, my favourite story um, in, in the book. Um, and I think lots of people's favorite story can you tell us a bit more about the green gang and who they were and yeah how that came to happen that story that you've you've written about well the green gang or the Qingbang, um, i mean you know were one of a number of gangs there was there was initially the blue gang the green gang and the red gang um the blue gang disappeared fairly early um and the red gang eventually sort of subsumed into into the green gang the green gang was run came to be run by um, a, a slightly odd character in many ways, a, a very short uh, man who came from, a boy at the time, who came from Gaochao, which is now a kind of a port. Uh, at the time was a, a village outside uh, that supplied fruit and vegetables into Shanghai. And um, he also started trading opium and selling opium. And his name was Du Yueshong. And he had very sticky out ears and he was known as Big Ear Du. That was his nickname. And he, through a real ruthless reign of terror and violence, uh, came to run the Green Gang. And the Green Gang was probably in the early late 1920s, early 1930s, probably one of the most profitable um, criminal organizations in the world. And it dealt with everyone. If you want to talk about globalization, um, really, um, globalization, I mean, the criminals are way ahead on globalization. I mean, they, they are dealing everywhere. I mean, you think Jardine Matheson is sitting there on the uh, Bund, you know, dealing with London and New York and Paris and, and, every, and Yokohama and everywhere that they're dealing with. But the Green Gang are doing the same thing and they're shipping opium around the world, as well as running casinos, brothels, opium dens and so on in Shanghai. They're making vast amounts of money. At some point, the French government French concession was slightly different to the, uh, you know, which is why we talk about the French concession. All of the foreign countries um, had largely come together to create the international settlement. But the French, being French, I suppose you could argue, stayed outside of that and went their own way. So the French concession was much more under the control of Paris than the international concession was ever under the control of London or Washington or everywhere else. But... Um, <clears throat> What the French decided was that they could not have Du Yueshun and the Green Gang running the French concession, which they effectively did. They had so many corrupt police on their uh, payroll. Uh, they had corrupt lawyers on their payroll and corrupt politicians on their payroll. So uh, they cracked down quite badly on Du Yueshun. They didn't really wipe him out, but they took away some of his business. So in 1932, he acted as if he understood what the French were doing and that he gave in. It was a kind of a surrender. Hands up, I surrender. You know, the French state is bigger than Du Yueshun and the Green Gang of Shanghai. So he said. And he invited all the top Frenchmen in Shanghai at that time to dinner at his house on Route Duma, which is um, just off of what is now Huahai Road. It's, it's now the, um, I forget the name of it, but it's, it's the big hotel down there now. Um, they um, all came to dinner. So we've got the political head of the French concession, the head of the French concession police force, who was corrupt as anything, Captain Fiore, who was also a senior figure in the Corsican mafia. Um, he, uh, he also brought the, the uh, top French lawyer in town, a top French army general, and um, the head of the largest French company in the French concession, Citroën 
the car company. And he invited them all to dinner. And he gave them all dinner and he was very nice to them. And they were all very pleased with themselves thinking, this is it. Do you a Shung now knows who's boss in this town and it's us, it's us French guys. Anyway, as part of the banquet, he turned up some uh, beautiful uh, shaman mushroom, which uh, was very famous, but it had to be cooked just right or you could get terribly sick. Well, uh, within an hour of the dinner, um, two of the Frenchmen were dead. Um, several other of the Frenchmen ran away to Hong Kong uh, to be under British protection. And they later died in hospital in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, the only one, there was only two men that survived that dinner that evening. One was Du Yue Shung, who had no ill effects whatsoever, even though he had eaten the mushrooms. To which the only answer everyone could give was, well, Chinese stomachs are a lot stronger than Western stomachs. That's why that was the problem. Um, and Captain Fiori, who was already being paid off by the Green Gang, who got sick but didn't die. And he got the message and he left on the next boat back to France. And if you go to cannes sur mer which is a very nice hilltop town just next to Nice on the Riviera, the biggest house in cannes sur mer is the house that Capitan Fiori retired to. And some people in Shanghai did joke that he did very well for an honest policeman's pay in order to be able to buy this massive house and never have to work again. Um, so it was, it was quite incredible um, that he, that, and, and the French never again um, took on the Green Gang. He absolutely sent, sent a message to them. Um, and he was able to stay in power. Of course, ultimately, um, he had to leave Shanghai when the Japanese invaded. But um, he, he, they remained a power for at least another seven or eight years in Shanghai. Wow. Wow. Um, my, my colleague Kendra is just showing a picture there of um, Big Ear Do himself. And it is, I, I've been to his, his house, which is now a hotel right in Shanghai. Um, and just learning more about that history and it's something that yeah so few people know about um and they had such a huge they controlled it right the french concession um and yes he, he controlled everything and in fact <laughs> about oh uh, it must be nearly 20 years ago now when i was first writing about du Yuexiong, i was summoned to lunch in shanghai by the du family who are still oh. in shanghai and of course i was aware of this story even then it's quite a famous old shanghai story and i just thought like Mm -mm. And they just finished Shintiandi at the time. So we went to some fancy restaurant in Shintiandi, which was about as fancy as it got in Shanghai at the time. And um, they, they actually were, were very interested in Du Yuexiong's history. And they were, they were quite open about the fact that he had been a gangster. I mean, funnily enough, of course, you know, he ends up going to Hong Kong um, during the war. And uh, by, he was, the, yeah, he suffered from that greatest problem of all the great narcos and drug dealers of all time. He started sampling the product and um, <clears throat> he became an opium addict himself. Um, uh, but when he was in Hong Kong, the British, and they won't, they won't admit this, the papers are still sealed on this, but the rumor is the British did a deal with him. And they said, if you do no more criminal activity, you can stay in Britain on a uh, British funded pension. And apparently he did, he stayed in a, in a flat down in Kennedy town um, gambling all the time on, on his British pension. Never went back to mainland China. And I think when he died, his body, he is actually buried in um, Taiwan, I think. But uh, yeah, he, he, got a, he got a British pension, which is more than I'll ever get, I expect. <laughs> um, thank you. So, so obviously a lot of these, these stories take place in places that you can actually, you can actually still see. Um, for example, you know, Du's um, house and, you know, in Tayo, you can see the bullet holes, as you spoke about. Um, yes. you, you go into an incredible amount of detail um, about these places. How much time did you spend there? You know, in the Gobi Deserts, in Yunnan, when you're researching, how much time do you spend in the location? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think locations are quite important, you know. I mean, um, I, people always say, you know, you don't really need to do that. And, and what do you get from going to... The hutong and, and you know there is in beijing there's a walking tour that does a midnight picking walking tour around all the locations and you know obviously when i was writing the book i really did kind of walk around and i, I you know the hutongs where the murdered girl lived the, the, the place where the body was found where the police station was where the autopsy was done 
where the suspects lived. Um, and, and I kind of feel if you can do that, uh, you, should, you should do that. I may be a little bit obsessive about it. One of the books I've written is a book called The Shanghai A to Z, which is literally every street in Shanghai. What was the old name? What, was the new, what is the new name? And what was on that street in the old days? And um, I get a little bit of money from that book every year because people do research their family history and all they know was Granny was born on Carter Road in Shanghai, you know, so they want to know what's Carter Road and what's left. Um, I was in Shanghai very early, uh, obviously in the 80s as a student. Um, and then through most of the 90s up, up until 2013. So I did my kind of quarter century. But, um, you know, I, I kind of walked those streets all the time and, and of course saw literally hundreds of them disappear. And similarly in Beijing with the hutongs, literally saw lots disappear. Um, but funnily enough, there's also still a lot left, um, which is not to say that, you know, any more needs to be destroyed, but that it, you still can get a sense of that place. And I think particularly for Shanghai, where you have the kind of high pi east west mix, um, you know, and I'm not one of these people that, that doesn't like mixing things up. I like mixing cultures and I like mixing people and, and traditions and things. Um, and, and there with Art Deco against modernism, against, you know, the traditional um, unique Shanghai um, long tang culture. And in Beijing as well, you know, I mean, the newer Beijing is not much to my taste, but, but Hutong Beijing, I mean, I first went there in the 80s, you know, you could literally walk for hours without ever leaving a Hutong. Occasionally you'd have to skip across the road back into a Hutong. But the, apart from Chang'an, there wasn't the kind of, um, you know, 15 lane roads so uh, it was kind of um, I think getting into those places is still quite important and understanding the geography of things how close things are to each other how far away people are from each other and, tr and trying to channel channel it a little bit you know trying to get into buildings and, and see places I, I think that's it's, it's it's really important if you can do it and, and I think if you do do it it'll also lead you to be a preservationist as well or as a Chinese official once said to me, he said, you know, you're just a brick hugger, right? You know, why, why do you hug bricks? And I was like, well, you know, bricks are important, I think, but you know, he didn't. Um, but particularly in Beijing and Shanghai, where you've got unique forms of architecture, um, you know, getting out and trying to experience as much of them as possible is really important. You know, I'm always trying to make that point that we, so where are we now? 3,000 hutongs in 1949. We're now down to less than 300. So, that, that, you know, if that was an animal, right, we'd be pretty concerned about what was going on. Except maybe we wouldn't because we lost the Yangtze crocodile and a few others. But, um, you know, hutongs only exist in Beijing. There are no hutongs anywhere else. Wild China can't take you anywhere else to see a hutong. It can only show you a hutong in Beijing. It's a unique form of architecture to that city. There aren't many cities around the world that have unique forms of architecture, right? You can come to London and see a Victorian semi, but you can go to every other British city and see a Victorian semi, right? You know, you can go to Paris and see a mansard roof, but you can go to every other French city and see a mansard roof. And you can go to Shanghai and see Art Deco, and you, you, know, you can go to, you know, Miami and Brussels and, and other cities and see Art Deco, but you can't see hutongs anywhere else. So when the last hutong goes, um, to me, that is like slitting the throat of the last panda. It, it's extinction, right? Because you won't be able to go and see that anywhere else. And the same is true of the, of the shikuman in, in Shanghai. When the last one goes, and right now we've got a massive attack on Old Town still going on, and Hong Kong, I mean, people don't pay attention to Hong Kong so much because foreigners certainly have never really gone north of Suzhou Creek much in Shanghai. I mean, not since the sort of new, new wave of foreigners. Um, when those go, those don't exist anywhere else either. They're a specific architectural form to Shanghai that has a historical reason for existing, um, you know, to, to crowd people in after the Taiping Rebellion, when, when Shanghai really became a concentrated city. The Hutongs in Beijing, of course, are essentially a Mongolian uh, Yuan dynasty uh, creation. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to argue the Mongolians never left an architectural tradition, the only empire that never left an architectural tradition, which is a sort of thing that people say all the time. Well, they did. They left the hutongs in, in Beijing. And um, 
So to lose those would be really difficult. And so also when I'm writing, I'm also trying, you know, Midnight in Peking hopefully also takes people into the hutongs um, and it makes them care about them even if they can't get to Beijing. And if they can get to Beijing, the first thing they want to see is hutongs. And City of Devils is really about, you know, art deco architecture, the ballrooms, the nightclubs and, and that style of architecture. And I'm always, you know, trying to emphasize that stuff as well because, you know, China has a... a this East-West mix in China, or this Mongolian Chinese mix in China in Beijing's case, led to these very unique forms. And, um, you know, th they are endangered and, and, you know, we need to be aware of them. And, and of course, those of us who write about these things and those of us that are involved in tourism, you know, sustainability, architectural sustainability should be very important to us. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Um, and obviously this is kind of off the book, but um, you talked earlier about the work that you're doing right now um, to sort of protect and preserve the architecture. Um, what is it that you are involved with? Well, I mean, all I try to do is um, recover as much of what went on in those buildings as possible. So when people think that they weren't very important, um, you know, who lived here? Nobody important ever lived here. Nothing ever lived here. Um, well, OK, maybe, you know, like obviously in somewhere like Shanghai, if you can find a famous Communist Party member in, from the 1940s who served with Mao in Yan'an, then that building might get saved. But particularly in the, um, the old Jewish ghetto in Tilanchao, in that district, you know, trying to uh, make people as aware as possible of that Jewish emigre history. You know, Shang, Shang, the narrative about Shanghai is a very interesting one. The, the sort of official narrative about Shanghai, which, which many, many people believe, Chinese and Western is, of course, you know, ripped from China by the Opium Wars, by the British, uh, all the other treaty powers come in and um, then it becomes an international treaty port. And it has some quite interesting sort of stuff going on fashion wise and architecture wise and literature wise. Uh, but, you know, it was really something for, for China to reclaim. It was Chinese soil. The story that isn't sort of thought about so much in Shanghai is that even though this was a creation of imperialism and violence, it also, Shanghai, and, and to a lesser extent Tianjin, but Shanghai became a port of last resort, a sanctuary, right? First of all, for Chinese people, right? So Shanghai's real growth as a city takes off during the Taiping Rebellion, when people are fleeing from the Taiping rebels. And then people keep coming to Shanghai for reason to escape flood, famine, pestilence, disease, poverty, whatever. After 1917, you know, we get this massive influx of Russians. And then from the mid 1930s to the late 1930s, we get this big influx of Jewish refugees because of the specificity of the international settlement, meaning that, first of all, Russians with no passports and then Jewish refugees can get in and be safe. In, um, in Shanghai. So it becomes a place that saves people's lives um, at a certain point. And that I think makes, makes is, is the contradiction that always makes Shanghai, for me, particularly, uh, particularly interesting. The contradiction that makes Beijing very interesting is this ancient capital, this ancient center that for a lot of the time I'm writing about becomes somewhat of a backwater because the capital in 1927 moves to Nanjing and then, of course, the Japanese sweep down from the, from the north and, and annexed Manchuria in 1937. And so the, the, the Beijing that I sort of first encountered in the 1980s and that everyone going to China now would encounter as this powerful kind of, you know, bigger than any person kind of architectural city. It really wasn't that, you know, for the first half of the 20th century. It was a city that went from, in that first half of the 20th century, went from the chaos of the boxer the Boxer Rebellion, through to, you know, the Japanese occupation and then the Civil War. So um, both of these cities are, are, are very different at that time um, and, and not always the way that we understand them now. We just think of Shanghai as this kind of commercial port city, innovative city. We think of Beijing as this monolithic, you know, capital of China, which, of course, you know, for most of China's existence, it hasn't been. Uh, and, and, and so therefore, both of the cities need to be re-understood as well. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, I think um, you you said it yourself, you know, the best way to do that is to 
is to explore and see it and to learn more and to understand, right, the importance of these places. Um, obviously, right now, most people are kind of stuck in one place. Um, what could we do right now for people who are hoping to, to learn more um, after this talk? What would you recommend? Well, I mean, you know, there ain't, there's a ton of good books on China. You know, and and, and there's, there's a ton of good books that were written back in the 30s, 20s and 30s and so on, that you can find online and all over the place, uh, you know, secondhand or through Gutenberg and you can download them. You don't even have to be able to go to a shop or have a postal delivery. So there's an awful lot that you can read. Um, and there's an awful lot of research people can do now. I mean, I talk to people literally almost every day who are doing, you know, family history is such a massive thing at the moment. Um, and I find that, um, you know, not only talking to Western families, but also Chinese families. You have to remember in 1949, all of these Russians, all of these Jews had to go somewhere. And all of the people who were there, who had the means to evacuate, evacuated, you know, and they went off to Britain or Australia or America or wherever they went. But, you know, also there was this massive evacuation and and of Chinese in 1948, 1949, people who felt that they did not want to live under um, any new regime that came along. And those people didn't just go to Taiwan, of course they went to Hong Kong and Singapore and they went to America and they went to Europe and Australia and Canada and all over the place. And they're often very interested in their Shanghai heritage as well. You know, And, and if they're Chinese and they their family grew up on, um, you know, uh, bubbling well road they don't necessarily know what bubbling well road is now so they also need to to find these things out and out of that comes more stories and uh, more photographs and more maps and more 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 letters and more memoirs and more everything so that that side of things is growing all the time and, and still keeps coming out and coming out and i think the whole kind of um, you know what, what they call the kind of who do you think you are fad right you know of discovering your own heritage and, and history um people have really been getting into that and as i say i mean it, hardly a day goes by i mean i know i'm like quite easy to find and i'm also like one of the sort of go-to people for this but you know every day people are, almost every day people are emailing me with you know my father was in the navy or my mother lived in shanghai for a bit or they were born in china missionary kids you know what, what, whatever it is and um that I think is fantastic because all those people are going away and writing memoirs and self-publishing them or just writing them as essays or just sharing them among their families and kindly sometimes sharing them with me. And out of those come, you know, yet more sort of stories to write about. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. I've nearly used up the whole hour. Um, so I'm just going to look at my chat box quickly um, and see what questions we have, just see if we can um, fill these in. Um, oh, awesome. Just lots of lovely, lovely comments um, in our chat box, which I'll share with you, Paul. Um, so lots of people saying that they've really enjoyed the discussion. Um, and yeah, great to have um great to have you here um we just had one question come through um which is what is your next project for what are you going to be working on next oh, well i never work on one thing at a time i have a book coming out a short book coming out this month at some point called strangers on the prior which is about some research i've been doing about the 300 or so shanghai jewish refugees and most of them were young women who decided to leave shanghai and go to macau in a kind of oriental Casablanca. They thought that from Macau, being a Portuguese colony and neutral, they might be able to get to Lisbon. And from Lisbon, maybe they could get to England or, or America. And about 300 people tried this, which is, which is pure Casablanca. Right? Um, it didn't work because there wasn't really many boats, there wasn't any boats going back to Portugal. What some of them did do though, is work, end up working for British intelligence, accompanying escaped British intelligence officers from Hong Kong, posing as their wives and going over into free China or smuggling themselves back through the Dutch East Indies or French Indochina or whatever to get to Chongqing or to get to British India. And so this, it's an amazing kind of sub story of the Shanghai Jewish refugee story. So I've done that 
Um, and I also, um, a couple of years ago, did a book called Destination Shanghai, which was 18 stories of foreigners, some you'd know, some you wouldn't know who went to China, so to Shanghai specifically. So there's the story of, I mean, Eugene O'Neill went to Shanghai and had a mental breakdown. Um, Langston Hughes went to Shanghai and, and wrote some amazing poetry. Um, uh, also, there was lots of people that you don't know about who, went, who came from Shanghai to become Hollywood stars um, or who went there as criminals or who went there to become showgirls and dancers. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. And that book did quite well. So the publishers came back and said to me, why don't you do a destination Peking? Destination Beijing. So I've just delivered a manuscript of 18 stories of foreigners, famous and not so famous and, and totally unfamous, who lived in um, Beijing. So some of those are quite fun, like J.P. Marquand, the American author who wrote the Mr. Moto series. He discovered that series and his wife and, and everything living in Beijing. Uh, Harold Acton, the great English aesthete, uh, was living the, in, in uh, Beijing for many years. Robert Byron, who wrote The Great uh, Road to Oxiana. I mean, the end of The Road to Oxiana is Beijing. He wrote it in a hutong in Beijing, and, and that's not really appreciated. So I've sort of written about 18 other sort of intrepid foreigners in the first half of the 20th century who went there. But the next sort of big book I'm working on at the moment to follow sort of Midnight in Peking and City of Devils is... Um, is a book about, I, I kind of want to get to the end of it. You know, Midnight in Peking was kind of when the Japanese attacked uh, China. City of Devils is really from that moment up to Pearl Harbor, 1941, when the Japanese take over the whole of Shanghai and intern the foreigners. And the next book I want to do is, which I'm working on at the moment, is a lot of true, different true stories, but in a novelistic style, like Midnight and, and Devils. Um, which is all about how everybody got out, right? Like what happened? I mean, there's 30,000 Russians with no passports. There's 25,000 Jews with no passports. There's all these Shanghainese that want to get the hell out of town. There's all these criminals that need to leave before the communists take over. Who got out? How did they get out? And who didn't make it? And what, what decidedly dodgy criminal activities did they get up to to get out? Because if you were even remotely considered a criminal, your chance of getting a visa and a passport for America or Britain or Australia or Brazil or all the other places that people went to was pretty much zero. So these guys had to get themselves out and girls had to get themselves out somehow. And um, there's so many great stories that I've been collecting of various criminal enterprises uh, for doing that. And these people ended up all over the world. And of course, once they were somewhere else and once they were in their 80s, 90s, and once they knew that I liked writing about these things, lots of them got in touch and I was able to find them. And I would get, I would be in contact with, you know, uh, Russian gangsters who went to Sao Paulo in Brazil, which is amazing. And um, Jewish refugees who used to run really dodgy nightclubs in Hong Kong, who ended up living on Bondi Beach. And they told me how they got from one to the other. Many managed to get to Palestine and then become citizens of the state of Israel. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, there was a million great stories and I'm trying to weave all of those stories into one kind of, you know, 350 page book that hopefully is quite gripping. Plus, wow. I must say, I must say the, the big project at the moment is we're, we're kind of working on the pilot for City of Devils for TV, which, which was going really strong. And then, of course, now everything has come to a shuddering halt for the last few months. But um, once filming gets up and running again in Los Angeles, um, that, that's kind of the next big big project. Wow, man, I can't wait for all of those. They all sound amazing. Um, so thank you so much for your time, Paul. Um, we have gone over our hour already. Um, I still have a million more questions, um, and I'm sure other people do as well. But thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Fantastic. Well, I just hope, you know, stay safe, everyone. And then when all this nonsense is done, I mean, I was supposed to be in China now, really working on various other things and um, it just isn't happening. So hopefully, um, you know, we can get past all of this with everyone being sensible and, uh, you know, all start to move around and meet up again. Absolutely. So if you, if you haven't already read Murders of Old China, please head over to Audible now um, to purchase it. 
Um, well, I, I should explain. I should explain, by the way. There's three ways you can get it. So what happened was Audible Audible came to me and said, look, we, we sell a lot of your audio books and Audible is Amazon. So we sell a lot of your books on Amazon. Would you do something just for us? So this only exists as an audio book at the moment, but it's read by me, which is either, you know, exciting or dreadful, depending on what you think of my voice for the last hour. But um, it because it's like eight and a half hours long. But um, it's... Um, it, it's sort of an interesting project, but the, and, and I enjoyed doing it because I like audio and I like audio books and radio myself. But um, the, the three ways to get it are if you are an Audible subscriber, um, which a lot of people are, you can use one of your golden tokens that you get every month uh, to, to get it. You, you can sort of pay, you know, good old fashioned cash for it. Or seeing as it's all about criminals, let's, let's talk about something criminal. You can sign up for the trial to... Uh, Audible, claim your free book that you get for a, for the trial, and then cancel your subscription afterwards. And I still keep my, uh, you still keep the book, and I still keep my royalty. So that works as well if you if you kind of want to uh, go about it that way. Audible are going to be cursing you. <laughs> no, no, they're getting their subscriber numbers. Believe me, Audible are doing very well in the last twelve weeks. I love Audible. I think it's great. I'm a yeah. subscriber. Myself. Well, again, one of the things about doing Audible that's fantastic is you know. One of the reasons I like writing books the way I do is I get out to this much bigger audience. It isn't just people who read books about China. But, you know, one of the things about Audible is the, the demographic of Audible is also really low. Like people used to think it was just old people listening to books, sitting around in their houses, drinking cups of tea and, you know, combing their cats or something. Right? <laughs> but it's not. It's actually young people. It's all the young people that are walking around with their headphones in, right? And all the old people are saying, ooh, trouble with them is they don't read books. Well, you don't know what people are listening to, right? You know, people could be listening to the most amazing audio books and they're listening to podcasts. And, and of course, you know, this is kind of halfway between a book and a podcast. And it's, it's 12 half hour chapters, you know. Um, it's as long as a book but you can break it up and listen to it out of sequence. And, you know, you can think of it more like a podcast or, or a series rather than, rather than a book. You have to start at the start and go to the end. Um, and I find that uh, the feedback I'm getting is, uh, is the, the demographic is, is really young and it's people who are listening to Audible and they like true crime podcasts, you know, they like Serial and all the other great true crime podcasts that have come along and that they're somehow finding their way to this. And all of a sudden they're just like, Oh, that was a really interesting thing. Different world. That's not a world I've been into before, but I really like it. So it, it, Audible have, have allowed me to like find another group of people to talk to about China, which is what I'm always looking for. Yeah, us too. Um, and I think if, if people want to follow your work, um, is chinariming.com the best place for them to go to learn more? Yeah, my blog has loads of stuff. I put up three old pictures a day of China on Instagram. You'll find me there as old Shanghai Paul. I'm on Twitter where I do talk a lot about China and at the moment a lot about Boris Johnson, but that, that's probably maybe not the, <laughs> that's the ruder side of my Twitter. But um, it's, uh, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm everywhere really. Yeah. Awesome. So we'll share, we'll share that with everyone um, after this event. Um, and thank you so much again. It's been a real pleasure. Um, if anyone who's listening was interested in our other events, as I said, you can head over to our YouTube channel um, for our past events or head to our website um, and sign up for our newsletter um, to hear of the upcoming events. Um, so we've got lots of exciting things coming up in the co next couple of months um, and we would love to see you there. So um, thank you again, Paul, so much. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joined us. Have a lovely rest of your day or evening, wherever you might be. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. So thank you.